Chapter 1, An Introduction to Group Accounts. We're going to start with the definition of a group. And we're going to start with the term subsidiary, which is a company that is controlled by another company. Now, what we're going to assume initially in this paper is that control comes via owning shares in another company. And if you own more than 50% of the shares in a company, that effectively gives you a majority vote. And that majority vote gives you control. So if you look at the diagram here, where A owns 100% and 75% of the shares in B and C, respectively, then both B and C are subsidiary companies. A is often referred to as the parent, or some people call it the holding company. But both B and C are referred to as subsidiaries. And what we do in group accounts is we pretend that all of these companies are one big happy family. We effectively add together the income statements or the statements of financial position of these businesses as if they were a single entity. So imagine a company that had property, plant and equipment of 100 in A, 10 in B and 5 in C, then the group's property, plant and equipment would be 115. And in very, very basic terms, that's what we're going to do to prepare a set of group accounts. We're going to essentially add the figures together. But as we'll see, things aren't quite that simple, but it's a good start. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to prepare an additional set of accounts on top of A, the parents' accounts, which show the total results of the entire group. This principle is sometimes referred to as the single business entity principle. We are pretending that these two or three companies are actually just one big entity. Now we're starting with group accounts because we're really in at the deep end. Your examiner has said that question one in the exam will be on group accounts and it's likely to be 25 marks or most of the 25 marks in question one. And as it's pretty much guaranteed to appear in your exam, it's a topic I would encourage you to become very comfortable with. It's not unknown in the exam to score close to or indeed completely full marks in this question. And clearly, if you're getting 20 to 25 out of 25 to start off with, that's a great start to any exam. Now, there are some rules. I won't read them out initially. What I'll do is I'll show you how these rules work by diving into the first illustration here, 1.1. Here, A acquires 100% of the shares of B on the 1st of January 2007 for $1,000. Now that thousand dollars is the cost of the investment. And one of the things we'll get used to initially is that that cost of the investment of a thousand dollars will appear in A's individual accounts. And that's what you've got here. You've got the individual accounts of A and B. And when A buys those shares, it pays, let's say, cash of a thousand, credit cash, and debit an investment, an asset, a long-term asset, that is a shareholding in B. And what we'll get used to initially is that what you pay to acquire a company becomes that cost of investment. Apart from that investment, you've got some other common figures, property, plant and equipment, inventories, receivables, cash, and even things like share capital, retained earnings and current liabilities. So a fairly normal looking statement of financial position. Notice that these are the individual sets of accounts of A and B. So if we're going to prepare the consolidated accounts, well, I want you to at least initially imagine a spreadsheet. Imagine you want to add together A and B to give you the group or consolidated accounts. In very simple terms, we're going to be adding these figures across to be giving us the group or consolidated figures. Now, we're going to do that for most of the assets and the liabilities that exist in A and B. So, for example, we're going to do that for property, inventories, receivables, and cash. 
Hopefully you can see that if I add these two figures together, that does indeed give me the group figures which appear on the following page. So keep your eye on those numbers, 10,700, 4,300, 1850 and 900, they all appear over the page as the group figures. Now one thing that doesn't get added in is this investment. This investment always becomes nil in the group accounts. And that was the first of the golden rules that were outlined above this illustration. The investment in the subsidiary doesn't appear in the consolidated accounts. It is in fact replaced line by line with the individual assets of the subsidiary and something called goodwill, which we're going to see in a moment. So, largely on the asset side, a spreadsheet. Now, again, if we look at the next line down, share capital, share capital isn't added across. The share capital of the parent becomes the share capital of the group. That's our second so-called golden rule here. We don't add share capital across. The share capital of the group is the share capital of the parent. The reason for that is that the people that own the shares in the parent automatically become the people that own the shares in the group. Imagine that you individually own the shares in A and that A owns the shares in B. Well, if we bracket A and B together, not only are you the shareholder in A, you're also the shareholder in the A group, and that's why the share capital figure is the same. So there's the second golden rule. Assets and liabilities are simply added together. So notice that for the liabilities figure, I do add those across. 200 plus 650 does indeed give me 850, again shown over the page. But again, retained earnings. If we go back to retained earnings, you'll see that those figures are not added across. In fact, what we're left with here are two unknown figures. And you might be able to see that what I've got here are two blanks cross-referred to two workings. And so these two figures, goodwill and retained earnings, are going to be two core workings for us in any, con any consolidation. Let me show you how you get to both of those numbers. We're going to start with goodwill. Now goodwill here, IFRS 3 is the accounting rule which dictates how we treat goodwill. Now don't worry about that accounting standard, IFRS 3, it's just there for information. International Financial Reporting Standard number 3 tells us how we treat goodwill. But this is a very, very simple idea. Goodwill is simply the difference between what you pay to buy a business and the fair value of the net assets of that business. The difference between what you pay and what that business is worth. So to calculate goodwill, we need the cost of the investment, the net assets of the subsidiary, and how much of the subsidiary we own. Just over the page, you can see our first look at a goodwill calculation. Now, this uses the data from A and B. We start with the cost of the combination. This is simply what we paid once upon a time to buy the shares in B. And going back to our illustration, you might recall that we did indeed pay $1,000. That information was told to us in the first line of the question. It also appeared on A's own statement of financial position. Wherever you're looking, that's what we paid, $1,000. So that's what we paid, but what was we B worth at the date of acquisition? Well, here, the date of acquisition is the 1st of January 2007. Again, just going back to the original question, that's when we bought or acquired the shares in B, the 1st of January 2007. Now, you've been given here B's figures at that date of acquisition, the 1st of January 2007. So if I just tidy this page up for a moment and get you to look at B's statement of financial position, if I said to you, what are B's net assets at this date, 
the 1st of January 2007. What are B's net assets? Now be careful. If you're thinking 1550, well you're halfway there. That's the asset figure of B, but don't forget B also has some liabilities. And so assets net of liabilities, literally net assets, is the 1550 minus the 650, 900. Net assets at the 1st of January 2007 were 900. Now the way we've just calculated net assets at the 1st of January is perfectly acceptable, but actually in the exam, what we're going to do instead is we're going to take the other two numbers, the share capital and reserve figure. Now, by definition, this has to be the same figure, 900. Otherwise, our so-called balance sheet wouldn't balance. So this is how we are going to calculate the net assets of B at any point in time here, the 1st of January 2007. So keep your eye on that 800 and the 100. You'll see that it's those figures that appear here to work out B's net assets at the date of acquisition. This tells us that B was worth 900 at the date of acquisition. And therefore, we paid 1,000 for a company that was basically worth 900. The difference between those figures we're going to call goodwill. And that figure, goodwill, will appear on the group statement of financial position. And I want you to think of goodwill as a group asset. Whilst it's possible to see that in an individual company, I have to say it's very, very rare to see it in, in an individual company. We are going to see it primarily in group accounts. And I want you to think of it as a group asset. And it's that 100 which appears in our consolidated accounts. I'm going to get rid of the gap and put it in there. 100, notice cross-reference to working one. Very good habit to get into that, cross-referencing. So now if I wanted to, I could add up all of the assets of the A group so that the total assets are 17,850. I'm still not completely done though because I need the retained earnings figure. Now, at this point, you might be a bit crafty and say, well, hang on a minute. I know that these two numbers should be the same. So can't I just be a little bit clever and just put in a balancing figure? Well, good thought, but no, we need to prove this figure, which is indeed 3,000. And for this, we need to show you a second working, retained earnings. Now, both of the workings that we're looking at here, working one here for goodwill, and working two, the one we're about to see, retained earnings, are both pro forma workings that you need to learn off by heart as soon as possible. They're going to appear in your exam, so the sooner you learn those, the better. So let's have a look at retained earnings. This one's a bit more fiddly. What we're going to do here, ultimately, is we're going to take the reserves of the parent, A, and we're going to add those to the post-acquisition reserves of our subsidiary B. Notice the post-acquisition reserves of our subsidiary B. Now, to find the figures, we're going to start with the figures given to us in the question. Now, given to us in the question, A had reserves of 100 and B had reserves, sorry, A had reserves of 3,000 and B has reserves of 100. So I'm going to put those figures straight from the question at the year end, if you like, 3,100. Now, for B, I'm interested, actually, not just in their reserves at the year end, but in their post-acquisition reserves. How much profit has B made since I bought B? Now, in this example, but never again in your studies, the year end is actually the same as the date of acquisition. And so here, the year end reserves of B are 100, and the reserves at the date of acquisition are 100. Now, in future examples, let's say in the next example we're going to see, those reserve figures at the year end are going to go up. As B makes profit, the retained earnings figure will go up. But in this example, but never again, there are no 
post-acquisition reserves because there are no post-acquisition figures yet. We're still standing at the date of acquisition. So we're going to take our share, 100% of, okay, at the moment not very exciting nil, but we're taking our share of B's post-acquisition reserves. So 3,000 plus nil is 3,000. Now, a bit later on, we're going to deduct something called impairments. But we'll come back to that later. It's the 3,000 which is going to appear in our consolidated balance sheet, and that's the figure we were expecting, cross-referenced to working two. So there it is. It balances, and we've introduced two new ideas, goodwill and group retained earnings. By the way, if you're thinking, why does goodwill exist? Why did we pay more for the company than that company was worth? Well, when you buy a business, Unfortunately, when you look at the statement of financial position for a company such as B, because of accounting rules, not all of B's assets are allowed to appear on its statement of position. For example, B might have a customer list or a reputation which, using accounting rules, aren't allowed to appear on its own statement of position, largely because you can't reliably measure the figure. But it still exists. So if you buy B, it will have a reputation. That reputation is not allowed to appear on its balance sheet, and so when you compare what you paid to the figure on its balance sheet or statement of position, then there will be this so-called difference, which we call goodwill. But you can think of goodwill really as reputation. You're having to buy the reputation of that business. Okay, so uh, we've introduced the concept of groups. Do make sure you're happy with what we've done there, and when you are, Let's have a look at the next lecture, which we'll look at in the next video lecture, example 1.1.